Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues. Let me welcome those who have joined us online or are watching the live stream. The roundtable discussion of COVID-19 conspiracies as a component of hybrid threats in the Eastern Partnership is the first event within the protected democratic values by tackling the pandemic-related disinformation project framework. The project is implemented by the Center for Policy Studies in cooperation with the experts for security and global affairs education in Romania and the Latvian Institute of International Affairs, and with support from the Black Sea Trust for Regional Cooperation, a project of the German Marshall Fund. Besides researchers representing participating institutions, other distinguished experts will join our meeting, so we may have a more comprehensive regional approach. So let me greet Monika Zuravashvili from Georgia and from Ukraine, who analyzed information and media manipulation related to the coronavirus pandemic and possible use of pandemic related fake news and propaganda in order to influence or destabilize the situation in Central and Eastern Europe. Already during the early stage of the pandemic, it was possible to observe signs of a hybrid operation of influence or rather different operations running parallel which, as other hybrid operations, use existing problems to aggravate the situation, manipulate the audience's consciousness, and potentially destabilize the situation. The significance of the issue has been noted by EU policymakers on a number of occasions. For example, in High Representative Borrell's op-ed published in March, the coronavirus pandemic and the new world it is creating, where he mentioned quote, a geopolitical component, including a struggle for influence through spinning, unquote. In the European Commission's joint communication released on the 10th of June, tackling COVID-19 disinformation, getting the facts right, and so forth. Eastern partnership countries have also, have also been subject to essentially the same propaganda campaign, with similar disinformation narratives being used, though in some cases with country-specific additions. For example, there are general allegations about COVID-19's artificial origins, which have been compared by some researchers to the joint Soviet East German operation infection, the one which in the 1980s ascribed the HIV AIDS to American biological warfare. But now, in case of some countries, similar allegations additionally point at US-sponsored biological research laboratories, so the propaganda narrative is adapted to the local specifics. Today we are particularly going to review the laboratory's issue in more detail. Other narratives sometimes may require even less adaptation. The stories about the lack of solidarity, which and capacity to support each other among the EU members, suggesting that only certain foreign powers may help, have been adapted to the Armenian, Ukraine, or Belarusian context. Attempts of panic mongering about imminent hunger and riots could be observed in some EU member states and elsewhere, including Armenia and so on. Just more very fresh example, one more very fresh example. Yesterday, a lengthy article appeared in Gazette.ru alleging that the lack of EU solidarity with Italy gives the rationale for Italy exit and using some conspirological narratives, including one that the government has been extending the state of emergency in order to make vaccination mandatory. This thing about the state of emergency and vaccinations is exactly word for word the same kind of argument that certain circles in Armenia have been using for months. So I would finish the, finish the introduction now, hoping that this project may supplement other studies on related topics, contribute to public awareness. Now, starting with today's presentations, I would like to remind the participants who joined on Zoom that it will already be possible to ask questions via chat during the presentations. And now I would like to pass the floor to Artur Zbikovs from the Latvian Institute of International Affairs. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you very much for uh, that. I want to welcome each and everyone who is joining us here in Zoom as well as in Facebook. And um, today, uh, let me share first um, uh, our presentation, um, if that is possible. Uh, 
Yes, share screen feature is enabled. Yeah, thank you very much for that. And hopefully you will see it now. So um, I will present with uh, my colleague, fellow researcher, Alexandra Palkova, and uh, we will mix one another so that you, so that I will not bore you just as she will not bore you. We will change one another. So it will have this um, mix of dynamics, which I think uh, even discussing such an issue is quite an important thing. Uh, although I must admit the issue is very important and very serious, and we have to take that in mind. So as you can see, today we'll talk, today we'll, we'll talk about prevailing themes in disinformation, misinformation, conspiracy theories during the COVID-19 pandemic, Latvian case analysis here in Latvia. And I will pass the mic, so to speak, to Alexandra here. So, hello, colleagues. Um, are you hearing me right now? Really good. Um, I hope so. So, let me start. As Arthur Sanarman before introduced, our conference topic focuses on the COVID-19 conspiracies as component and um, of the hybrid threats. And today we are going to talk about these prevailing terms in disinformation and conspiracy theories and during uh, COVID-19 pandemic. And today we will talk about about disinformation, misinformation, and conspiracy theories. First of all, talking about the definitions because it's really important to understand what which is the, what you like. What is the difference between the terminology what we use, and especially if we if I may ask Arthur's come back to the one slide before, um, especially if we're trying uh, also prevailing these topics and themes in disinformation, misinformation, and conspiracy theories, and um, we will try to show most. Um, most known examples in Latvia and also try to show you some conclusions what we can have after talking about this disinformation, misinformation and conspiracy theories. And may I ask you in the next slide, please. So as you can see, the disinformation is a fuss of the information instead of mislead, especially the propaganda. And it is important to know that this is issued by the government organization or rival process um, and power of the media. And example of, of the difference, if we're talking about misinformation, we should show that this is a fuss on insecured information. And uh, it is really important to understand the difference between two this terminology, because one of the examples, what you can see is that this information that usually is lead from the misinformation, the same as if we're talking about the conspiracy theories. And here it should be noted that, for instance, conspiracy theory is usually one of the bases, if we, uh, we instrumentalize it, it is one of the bases of this information, which uh, continue to the hybrid threat. And um, I will ask my colleague to go to the next slide. And it is important because uh, now we are analyzing the Latvian case analysis and um, I will pass Mike to the Arthur's bag because he will talk about these three prevailing themes in the COVID-19 pandemic in Latvia. So, yeah. So those three prevailing themes in, in um... In COVID-19, uh, when it comes to COVID-19 context in Latvia, are uh, here. Treatment of for coronavirus, the origin of COVID-19, and finally, which I find the most important maybe for today's discussion, talking about hybrid, thre hybrid threats, is humiliating information or derogatory information uh, about Latvia and its action in context of coronavirus. So let's look at all of these, at all of these, um, one by one. So let's start with the first one. Uh, prevailing themes in disinformation, misinformation, conspiracy theories about treatment for COVID-19. These are the main features. First and foremost, um, mostly, mostly, uh, it is misinformation with either unclear motivation or due to honest delusion. A lot of people um, use social media, uh, especially Facebook, to spread this information with was probably idea to help find out the way how to treat coronavirus. Although again, it's really hard to distinguish this clear motivation. Sometimes, sometimes, and this is the second point, this disinformation exists, but rather 
with aim to sell alternative medicine. So a lot of let's call them businessmen and businesswomen uh, are trying to sell some homeopathy, let's say, for instance, in order to cure the virus. And uh, that's why they spread the disinformation about vaccines. They spread the disinformation about traditional medicine that it isn't working in order to help you and so on and so forth. And that's why they provide their own unique product, which you can easily buy here and there, uh, which will definitely help you not only overcome the coronavirus, not only preserve yourself, but also uh, you will be immune to other diseases. Finally, conspiracy theories, but mostly they are imported, i.e. people are translating them from other languages and spreading via social networks, usually Facebook. Um, I, would, I would say, I would argue that um, most of the cases we were unable to find a conspiracy that originated here locally and gained a massive attraction and a massive attention. In most of the cases, uh, these conspiracy theories are translated from other languages um, and here are gaining the spread. So this is something that we have to bear in mind. Second it is, of course, about the origin of COVID-19. Here, on the other hand, uh, conspiracy theories dominate. Uh, in what we were analyzing, we again couldn't find any evidence of disinformation or misinformation when it comes to the when it comes to origin of COVID-19. Again, these theories are translated into Latvian. Uh, there is no evidence of a local conspiracy theory that gained massive following. But the one important thing about origin is that not only casual users of, of Facebook, let's say, were spreading this um, conspiracy theories, but also some lesser known, but still public figures, uh, which again, have this reputation of uh, conspiracy theories themselves. So to a certain degree, COVID-19 became yet another theme, yet another niche for those conspiracy theorists who would like to not only um, talk about uh, 5G towers or 9-11 or, or something like that. Cor coronavirus and the spread of it and the origin of this virus became yet another popular theme among professional, so to speak, conspiracy theorists. And uh, the theme about origin of this virus is particularly, particularly popular. And finally, uh, what I found, what I find uh, one of the most important and one of the most interesting things is that uh, uh, disinformation, misinformation, conspiracy theories about life and its actions in context of the COVID-19. So the most uh, common thing for misinformation and disinformation, uh, the most information that we analyzed actually consisted of this um, humiliating information about Latvia's government and state agencies and how they act and their solutions and decisions. Um, this information was usually spread, spreading by Latvian opposition politicians with aim to undermine government solutions and promote themselves. So it's a clear path, an easy one, so to speak, in order to gain popularity. You basically humiliate the government, state agencies, the way how they act, the way how they react, and uh, the way how they are not very much helping at all. These are the, mo the most popular points of talking. And uh, you say that you, when you will become the next prime minister, will improve the situation vividly and everyone will see and praise you the way how, how good you are as a governor. In reality though, um, government's doing very much indeed and good, uh, obviously helping solve these issues, reacting very quickly, and um, doing their best in order to overcome all the problems that coronavirus is causing here. Uh, obviously, there is Russian outlets, outlets that are close to Kremlin and have a history of spreading propaganda. And not only close to Kremlin in terms of uh, supporting their narrative, but also um, um, belonging to the, to, the, to, the, to the Russian government, uh, but disinforming about Latvia's actions. And 
I wouldn't say that there were a lot of disinformation regarding uh, the way how Latvia acted and the way how uh, people living here um, perceive the virus and uh, live with it. Uh, but still, it was visible. And obviously, narrative uh, was quite the same as it used to be before. Uh, respectively, Latvia is not able to cope with this virus, that economic crisis will hit it hard, that uh, Russian-speaking minorities will suffer the most due to government's inability to help them and to integrate them well. And finally, that the savior here is obviously Russia and the only state that is capable to save Latvia and Baltic states in general is again Russia from, from, their, from their perspective. Um, this is the way how they put this narrative, this, uh, this information, mostly yet again, it comes to statistics. Let's say some outlets uh, argue that uh, uh, the European funds make up to 20% of, of Latvia's GDP and uh, which is absolutely not true. It's roughly about 4%. Same goes with the unemployment levels that they are way higher than, it's re than it is in reality. So this is how these Russian outlets, these Russian media are trying to portray the situation. And finally, there were several misinformation cases with unclear motivation or honest delusion about government's decisions. Again, uh, one of the most important thing I, I, I think here is the platform uh, that is Facebook. One more time, a lot of uh, users, mostly casual users, are spreading this misinformation about the way how Latvia is acting and the, that, oh, uh, Russia on, on the one hand is helping so much, yet we here sit and didn't receive anything. Or here in the United States of America, uh, the government is helping so much paying uh, their citizens one uh, $1,200 and so on and so forth. However, here we sit and we do nothing. So in most of the cases, it seems like an honest delusion or at least an unclear motivation. It's really hard to pin down and say for sure that they're promoting a Kremlin narrative here or are walking for, 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 for Russia. So in most of the cases, they are casual, casual, uh, casual users uh, that are, so to speak, not that much happy with what, with what is going on here. Nothing more than that. So about other uh, interesting cases of, uh, with particular examples uh, of uh, prevailing themes, uh, we'll tell, we'll, Alexander will, will tell you about them as well. Yes, it should be continued that if we compare Latvia and analyze the EU a case that if we compare Latvia to other countries, the main um, conspiracy theories, disinformation, misinformation narratives and the topics which we can see is about, for instance, SARS-CoV-2, which is um, came like this is about the virus which came from and was created in a lab of the Wuhan. I'm completely sure that you have heard about that or the vaccinations and wearing masks which activates this coronavirus. But the most interesting part is about this is not an agenda on the Latvia and more more likely what we can uh, see is the examples which we can see also on the presentation slides um, there there is uh, lies about the um, of the coronavirus and uh, here you can see three examples of them which is interesting because also sometimes uh, what we can see that the, the social media also as it before mentioned Arthur's for instance Facebook Twitter is the most likely where we can see the disinformation and misinformation um, and also if we're talking about uh, maps because of the thing that uh, there is no so much information before when the coronavirus and uh, started there is uh, some of the leads which uh, continue also posted in a Facebook, which uh, lead to this disinformation, misinformation. And um, to continue, um, I think that we don't have so much time. So I think we should continue to the conclusions. And uh, that's why I pass back the mic to the Arthur's because we are running out of the time. Okay, so as for the conclusions, um, in most cases, uh, prevail three themes of misinformation, disinformation, conspiracy theories, treatment and origin of COVID-19, 
as well as uh, as well as Latvia in its in its actions. Uh, share of disinformation in public is smaller than misinformation and conspiracy theories. Could be explained by government and states agencies' decisions. This is quite an important thing. Uh, our officials were quick to react, and uh, they debunked a lot of various lies about COVID-19, explained them and communicated their solutions in an understandable manner. This is the way, I guess, uh, how to react best in order to fight against misinformation, disinformation, conspiracy theories. And uh, this is one of the reasons why um, conspiracy theories and uh, disinformation about the origin of COVID-19 and treatment for COVID-19 weren't that popular, weren't that much common in public space. No one almost, especially when we talk about highest officials, no one denied the existence of COVID-19. So we didn't have any case of, uh, uh, let's say, Belarusian President Alexander Lukashenko, who to a certain degree uh, was a COVID-19 dissident. Uh, we didn't have something like that. And uh, this is one of the reasons why also society um, uh, believed in COVID-19 existence and reacted uh, adequately to the measures that government was taking in order to uh, save their people, their citizens' losses lives. Um, usually, this information was spreading by either opposition politician or within to undermine government actions and promote themselves or by business owners who were trying to sell alternative medicine. Um, again, some disinformation about the situation in Latvia uh, spread Russian outlets that are close to Kremlin. And finally, conspiracy theories which gained public attention were mostly translated and were not originating locally. And that's, that's it. Thank you very much for, for your attention. Thank you very much. much. I think the, the speculations that the Latvian government failed in dealing with COVID-19 are a bit strange from my point of view at least because as far as I know, Latvia is the, one of the most successful countries in the EU dealing with the issue with the least number of deaths per million people along with Slovakia, if I'm not mistaken. The most interesting thing about about uh, the way how uh, the disinformation and misinformation around that is cornered is that uh, Latvia will collapse in terms of economics, uh, that the businesses will shut down, and we will and we will not be able to recover from that, and uh, a lot of people are going to emigrate from Latvia, which only will foster the, the worsening of the situation. This is one of the main narrative, if not the main narrative when it comes to assessing, uh, when it comes to disinforming about uh, the way how Latvia is coping with uh, COVID-19, which is, again, if you ask me, um, is not true at all. Okay, thank you very much. And I would like to ask if Katalin is ready to present the Romanian case now. Or... Yes. Hello, everyone. Yeah. Uh, yeah uh, first of all, uh, I would like to thank you, Armen, for inviting us, for inviting the experts for Security and Global Affairs Association from Romania to be part of this uh, project. And we are honored to be today with you and to discuss uh, such an important topic. Also, uh, I would like to um, say that uh, we will present a more regional approach on the, on the pandemic uh, as we have two countries to, to monitor for, for the project. And um, further, we will, uh, we will talk about the other countries in the, in the region. But for this first session, we have uh, thought that it would be interesting to have a comparative analysis um, between the uh, Republic of Moldova and Romania, as I am from the Republic of Moldova and my colleague uh, Catalin is from uh, is from Romania, but we are based in Romania, so we can we can do 
this comparative analysis. And uh, this research is very important for us as, as this is the first project uh, in which we will approach this information as a, as a concept, as a phenomenon that uh, is spreading in the, in the region. And also, I'd like to say that this research is an opportunity to depend our analysis uh, in the in a later stage, as we have some uh, proposal for our men and for the team uh, to look mm, on some thematic areas that we will uh, approach later uh, uh, until October, and I will uh, mention these uh, these topics uh, at the end of my uh, and my colleague presentation. Uh, what is important uh, to say uh, today and to start the analysis today is uh, to accept the fact that the uh, coronavirus uh, changed our behavior and influenced our, uh, a lot the, the content of the public policy that are addressed to, to the citizen, especially to those who will have uh, soon uh, an, an invitation uh, to, to be part of the electoral process. This is the case of the Republic of Moldova, but also of the Romania, as we have local elections in, in, in autumn here. Um, during the few years, uh, the phenomenon of disinformation and misinformation has become particularly widespread and uh, offered a lot of opportunities, not only for uh, foreign actors to be uh, more uh, to have an influence in the region, but also for the in domestic political actors to use this window of opportunities to spread some messages and to influence the mentality of the of the citizens and uh, countering this information and to have this partnership between uh, civil society experts, between media experts and IT experts together uh, work with uh, public institution representative is very important at, uh, at this stage. We cannot cope with this information alone. Uh, I mean, we, uh, when I talk about us, uh, we, I, I, am, I am talking about the experts from uh, think tanks and civil society. Um, I think the most important thing is to, to have at, at the end of this project some solutions and some recommendations for public institution how to deal with this information in, in type of uh, uh, coronavirus and how to address the phenomenon of disinformation regarding the, the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic. Um, for Romania and for Moldova, we have some similar uh, thematic areas that are approached by different actors, by different stakeholders with a political interest or economic interest, interest in, in, uh, in the region or in, within the countries. Uh, and uh, those uh, thematic areas are uh, conspiracies surrounding the spread of pandemic. And this was also something uh, uh, that was mentioned by our colleagues from Latvia. Uh, does this virus exist or not? Uh, we had some uh, declarations or speeches of uh, the president in the Republic of Moldova saying that uh, the, the virus is not so, uh, uh, how to say, is not so dangerous. And in the end, we have uh, more than 20,000 cases in Moldova of uh, infected uh, people. Also, another subject for, um, uh, for uh, um, conspiracies and uh, news around this subject are that uh, SARS-CoV-2 is, is an exaggerated uh, danger uh, that is intended to generate pa panic and fear. That means to control the mind of the people. Uh, and this comes not only for the political actors, but also com comes from, uh, from the church and uh, from some uh, uh, experts that are not uh, well known in, in the, in, within the country. Also another topic is that Western organizations are using this crisis to prepare for future military intervention. And this is a topic that we propose to, to depend uh, with the analysis uh, during this, uh, this project, as we had a lot of news about uh, NATO military forces that uh, will in invade uh, Romania or will invade uh, the region. 
also we would like to say that the um, objective of those who control national and international public opinion on information about the virus is to impose forced vaccination of the population microchipping together with administration of the vaccine against COVID-19. This is another subject for conspiracy in the Republic of Moldova. Uh, the virus is used for, for an orchestrated attack on the church. And during the, this project, you will see that we will rely a lot of information that is um, approaching the church as an important geopolitical actor in, in also in both Republic of Moldova and, uh, and Romania. And this can be another proposal for, for a, a policy paper to be developed during this uh, project. Uh, one of my um, my favorite topic is that Russia and China are the uh, the two states that are helping uh, Republic of Moldova uh, to cope with the pandemic, and the European aid and solidarity principles are exaggerated as we um, don't have a proper reaction from uh, from uh, EU countries in order to help Moldova. But this is not true, and this is also a subject for disinformation that is used by the uh, by the government and the Republic of Moldova. Um, the fact the situation in the Republic of Moldova is much better than in neighboring states. The authorities manage the situation. Another topic for disinformation and conspiracy against the, the board, uh, the neighboring states, as uh, our um, chief of the government, our prime minister, was uh, uh, using some numbers that are. Uh, showing a comparative analysis between. Uh, Republic of Moldova and some regions from Romania, not all Romania as a country, to, to show how the government is coping with the, with the pandemic. Uh, and uh, I think one of the last topics that we will uh, uh, want to approach during this, uh, this project is that uh, um, how the authorities are dealing with this uh, pandemic, uh, as they are try, uh, trying a lot to convince us that the authorities are facing the challenges uh, posed by the pandemic and everything is under control and they have the res necessary resources for that. And all the decision making process is, uh, is uh, um, uh, administrated in order to um, uh, promote the necessary support for the population in, in order to avoid uh, further um, challenges and risks associated with the pandemic uh, uh, spread. I think during the next period of uh, August, uh, between August and October, we should address uh, some of these uh, topics that we have identified as uh, uh, subjects that are used for uh, misinformation, that are used to promote some uh, conspiracy theories in Republic of Moldova, but also in Romania. And uh, we would like also to, to highlight the, the role of different actors. That means political actors, that means uh, um, foreign uh, interested actors that I, I have in mind Russian Federation here and some uh, international organizations. Uh, I have in mind here China as uh, um, Actually, this was one of the topics that appeared in many of the newspaper in, uh, in Moldova, who is supporting Moldova and not. Uh, and um, for recommendation, I will propose to, to have at the end of the project, um, maybe an, uh, a common paper or a common uh, chapter of a paper where, where we will address some recommendations for different stakeholders in the region, how to deal with this theory of, of con conspiracy uh, around the, the topic of uh, coronavirus in the region. It's not enough to rely on civil society. It's not enough to rely on media. I mean, independent media to fight against the uh, disinformation and to um, promote uh, uh, critical thinking wh while we are talking about coronavirus. It's important to create some partnerships between the 
uh, actors that are involved in the um, in to in, are involved in this uh, war against misinformation in the in the region, and a comparative analysis can be also useful for us. Um, I would like to invite uh, my colleague Catalin um, to present his ideas regarding the the Romania. Um, thematic areas that are more um, um, present in the in the newspapers and on the social media, and how the authorities uh, are approaching these uh, these issues. Katalin. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, first of all, I like to ask you to excuse uh, my background, but I'm on the road. So um, I will I will continue uh, the idea that uh, my colleague uh, uh, presents to you. Uh, in Romania, uh, the national authorities um, saw a significant rise of misinformation during the last four months of uh, COVID-19 pandemic. So uh, in this case, the strategic communication group as uh, the official channel of uh, of information. Uh, has a distinct role in publishing uh, relevant uh, data and news about, uh, about international statistics and um, about the governmental actions. So uh, just a few days before the anti um, force, uh, the decree of uh, President of Romania, Mr. Klaus Werner Johannes on the establishment of the state of emergency in, uh, in, in Romania, um, a picture showing the military technique of the Romanian army um, um, appeared in the uh, appeared in the social media. Uh, so the, the the post on the Facebook outlined that the Europe Defender uh, military exercise on the public streets of uh, Cluj County. Um, it's uh, it's uh, example of. Uh, um, invasion of, uh, of NATO troops in, uh, in Romania. So uh, another source of, of misinformation uh, presents in Romania was uh, the online portals of Orthodox uh, community. Um, these sites um, um, showed uh, us that the Christian Orthodox uh, 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 practitioners um, are asked to not to comply with, uh, with any measure imposed by the authorities in, uh, in Romania, uh, because uh, this is, um, I don't know uh, uh, how to say, it's, a, it's, it's an attempt uh, to mess uh, microchipping in, uh, in, in Romania. So uh, moreover, those behind uh, this, uh, this sites claim that COVID-19 pandemic, it's a conspiracy of uh, 5G technology in, uh, in, in the world. So um, another, another problem, another problem uh, with, with the misinformation and disinformation in, uh, in Romania, uh, it's uh, that here, uh, we don't have common solution for combating the misinformation and disinformation. Uh, why, I'm, what, why I'm saying this is just because um, giving their input on combating the fake news phenomena, uh, the strategic communication group underlined that um, uh, and, and the need for uh, cooperation between official institutions and public health experts. Um, just a few weeks ago, uh, the president of, um, of uh, lower house of, of parliamentary majority, I said parliamentary majority because uh, in Romania we have uh, a minority, uh, a minority government, uh, the, the ruling party uh, has just 20% in the parliament. Uh, so at the beginning of, uh, of, of, of this month, um, the president of, uh, of uh, Social Democratic uh, Party um, the post such information uh, about pandemic, uh, about the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, uh, where he, un uh, he underlined the idea that uh, this, uh, this pandemic uh, doesn't exist and uh, the, the government just uh, is, is trying, just is trying to 
um, uh, to uh, regime in uh, in Romania. So um, under this condition, cooperation between state institutions to combat the phenomenon of the fake news was impossible. Uh, my uh, my proposal for for the next two and three months is to to, to have uh, some uh, some uh, papers about the fight against uh, fake news uh, and providing official sources of information in Romania and in the Republic of Moldova. And uh, also uh, a paper about the source of social instabilities and misinformation and post-truth uh, phenomena. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you very much. So uh, I'm, um, I'm waiting your, your question if you, if you have one. Uh, just a few words to add here. If you are talking about this information that is uh, coming from Russian Federation, usually this, uh, this information messages are spread from Republic of Moldova to Romania. And usually all of these messages have a traditional foreign policy oriented mission. That means that it involves church and it involves also some political actors that are not uh, well uh, seen in the in the public opinion. I'll give the example of Sputnik, Sputnik Moldova. Uh, it's easier to spread the information from Sputnik Moldova because it's translated already in Romanian. And from here you can take the information and to, uh, to spread the uh, those messages into uh, between uh, uh, Romanian uh, uh, social among the Romanian social media users. Also, uh, as I mentioned, some political actors that are not well seen in 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 Moldova, such as uh, uh, Yuri Roshka, that in the past was uh, um, an adept of unification with Romania, and now is uh, paid by by Russian Federation, uh, is using uh, Sputnik and is using other uh, few newspaper in order to spread conspiracies about the uh, vaccination uh, uh, against COVID-19. So you will see a lot of topics that are coming from the Republic of Moldova uh, and uh, are, uh, are spread in, 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 in Romania. And also you will see a lot of, um, this is also uh, um, something that is not usual for Moldova and Romania. While opposition in Moldova is um, uh, talking about the danger of coronavirus and uh, is uh, putting pressure on the government to take some measures that will stop the spreading of the, of the, the virus, in Romania we have leaders of opposition spreading this information with the aim to, to, to have some um, advantages during the, the next uh, electoral campaign. So it's something different that we have in Latvia. That's why uh, this project it will be interesting for us to, to have this comparative vision regarding the, the, regarding the topic that we will approach during these five months. Thank you, Armin. Uh, thank you very much. And of course, a uh, longer final paper with the recommendations would be very welcome. We briefly mentioned it in the project already. And uh, now I would like to pass the floor to Sergei Gerasimchuk, who is going to allow to compare the situation in Central Europe and Ukraine. Yes, thank you very much, Armen, dear colleagues. I'm sorry for, for the bad light. But the weather is too sunny to, to, to make it normal. <laughs> First of all, con congratulations with a very interesting project and a very interesting endeavor and very topical one. And uh, I'm glad to see many familiar faces and uh, I'm glad that we have such an opportunity to see each other in Zoom, but I do hope that sooner or later we will be able to have uh, offline meetings to, to discuss the uh, topic of COVID-19 as something that was in, in the past and that's something we have to, to learn lessons from. 
Uh, also, sorry for a bit off top, Angela, you are too modest because uh, a year and a half ago, we had a very good uh, Ukraine-Romania forum in Bucharest organized by you. And we had a session about disinformation uh, there we, we, with the representatives of NGOs, both from Romania and from Ukraine speaking about disinformation. And at that time, it was not that topical because uh, it was... Uh, about disinformation in general, but now with COVID-19, it's a great crash test. And, and uh, I'm glad that that we were to some extent prepared for, for this challenge uh, because we discussed it even before it became vivid and obvious for everyone. Uh, speaking about our experience and speaking about the findings I want to share, mm -hmm. it's the result of uh, two papers. So one is uh, still being elaborated and one was released back in May uh, this year, uh, which was organized by our organization Foreign Policy Council Ukrainian Prison. And in the first one, we tried to, to study the cases of our neighboring countries, in particular Poland, uh, Slovakia, Hungary, and also Czech Republic as a member of B4. And in the paper that we are elaborating right now, we focus on Eastern Partnership countries, and uh, we are more or less on the same page with you. However, we, we, we have a bit of a difference in our project because uh, as some of you probably know back in uh, 2018 our organization released uh, disinformation resilience index was for eastern partnership uh, v4 countries uh, and uh, baltic states and romania and in our current paper that we are elaborating also with the kind support of black sea trust we are trying to compare the results we had into 2018 with the results uh, we have now how 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 it is interconnected i mean the resilience of the countries already elaborated and their resilience towards disinformation related to covid-19 and let me focus a little bit on, on on a few countries as i've mentioned on v4 countries and on ukraine and what I want to focus on, it's not only about uh, conspiracy theories and the main narratives, but also on, because they are more or less the same. It's uh, 5G like everywhere, it's uh, American influence like everywhere. Uh, but uh, also I wanted to focus a little bit on um, the way the politicians instrumentalize it for their own purposes. Uh, and here it will be really interesting correlation with what you, you've already mentioned, uh, Angela, about opposition and ruling party and how they instrumentalize COVID-19 for their purposes. Because here we have absolutely different cases if you take a look at, at Central European states. And to start with uh, Slovakia, as you can see, uh, in Slovakia, uh, the COVID-19 crisis um, coincided in time with the elections and the change of the ruling elite. Because as mad as that political party, which was in power for 12 years, uh, uh, didn't manage to gain the majority in the new parliament. So it was Olano, uh, which was the, which became the ruling party. And therefore, uh, we can see that uh, this political force, which is uh, a bit more pro-European in comparison to, to other political forces in, in Slovakia and uh, with a bit better image in the European Union, uh, was quite effective and efficient in uh, fighting COVID-19 in the country. The restrictive measures and quarantine measures uh, were applied two days after the beginning of, of uh, uh, the spread of the disease in Slovakia. And uh, therefore, in Slovakia, we can see clear pattern of uh, opposition versus ruling party. Opposition, uh, which is using the fake news, which is using disinformation about uh, COVID-19 for attacking uh, the ruling political party. And it was uh, the representatives of SMER as the, uh, who were talking about American uh, biolaboratories and American uh, bioweapons. Uh, 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 and uh, the narratives like these were mostly anti-American. Plus, we had a very clear note that uh, uh, opposition parties were blaming the EU for lack of support towards Slovakia, for lack of uh, solidarity, lack of cohesion within the EU. And uh, again, it was instrumentalized against the ruling political party. Uh, speaking about uh, China and Russia, 
in our study, we didn't notice uh, significant Russian influence in Slovakia. With regard to China, the situation is a bit different because indeed China was promoted by the opposition politicians and by some uh, media resources as the altruistic uh, power which is ready to support. And Chinese model was uh, described as an efficient one worth to be applied in Slovakia. Speaking about the neighboring Hungary, the situation is totally different because if uh, in uh, Slovakia, opposition tried to instrumentalize uh, COVID-19 uh, fakes and uh, disinformation to weaponize it uh, against the ruling party. In Hungary, uh, Fidesz was weaponizing this uh, disinformation for her because Fidesz is a ruling party and uh, Viktor Orban as a prime minister, they, they tried to apply COVID-related narratives for strengthening narratives they, they are promoting for years and years. Certainly it was uh, George Soros and his uh, evil uh, will to promote uh, uh, the disease, to, to spread the disease around the region, uh, which is uh, like old tale about Soros as a uh, evil guy for Viktor Orban. Plus, uh, interesting original uh, aspect, uh, you definitely know that the V4 countries were very, uh, uh, how to say, pessimistic about uh, spread of migration around uh, the European Union. And uh, migration was linked to coronavirus. Uh, state media and the uh, ruling party was promoting the idea that it's migrants who bring you the disease, so you should limit migration. Otherwise, uh, if you do not limit migration, you won't be able to limit uh, uh, to limit uh, COVID-19 and the spread of the disease. So in case of Hungary, we can see this cementing, uh, cementing uh, power. We can see this uh, anti-migrant uh, sentiments promote, propelled with COVID-related uh, uh, tales, fakes, whatever. And uh, speaking about China, again, here we can see a lot of compliments towards China. China is perceived as the country that supported uh, Hungary. This idea is promoted by the ruling party. And uh, the point is that uh, uh, Viktor Orban and his party emphasized that it was mostly China and Turkish uh, council who supported Hungary in, in, in the time of crisis, uh, whereas the EU was not that much efficient. Uh, speaking about another case, uh, Czech Republic, uh, here we can see again that uh, it was uh, uh, Anna and Andrei Babiš, the prime minister, who tried to instrumentalize uh, COVID-19 for their own political purposes. So the first point was, uh, uh, and it's again some specifics because it's different from other countries. Uh, one of the statements of Andrei Babish was that uh, we should forget about the European deal in the time of coronavirus because coronavirus is much more important than, than, than any green deal, so forget it. Also, coronavirus uh, was used for muting the current scandal uh, with the uh, um, inappropriate usage of European funds by Andrei Babiš himself. Uh, plus, uh, here in, uh, in, in the Czech Republic, we have much stronger Chinese influence and uh, mostly promoted by the president of the country, Mr. Zeman, who says that the uh, Chinese model is an excellent one and it, can be, it should be applied in all over the world, including the Czech Republic and the EU. Also, Zeman uh, said that uh, China is the only country that helped. Uh, speaking about Russian propaganda, it is also visible in, in the Czech Republic, and it's mostly anti-American, again, blaming Americans for artificially creating the virus and using it as uh, biological weapons. And uh, also, also the Russian, pro-Russian uh, forces and media in, in the Czech Republic were uh, developing the idea that uh, uh, that uh, the government is artificially increasing the level of panic, uh, whereas there is no, no need for any kind of panic because the coronavirus is not uh, a virus uh, in fact and stuff like that. 
Then he, again, as in the case of uh, Hungary, we see this anti-migrant sentiment. So both in Hungary and in, in the Czech Republic, it was said that it's migrants, these are migrants who can spread the virus. So stop migrants and you will stop the virus. Uh, moving further in the region uh, to Poland, uh, if we take a look at the Poland, we can see that again, it was uh, used by the government for cementing its power. And if you follow the saga about uh, the presidential elections in Poland, you might have noticed that first it had, they had, the elections were to take place in, in, in May and it caused uh, great political turmoil. One, one of the candidates, uh, Malgorzata Kidawa Blonska, even quit the campaign because she said that as an opposition candidate, she cannot participate in, in, in the elections. And it was in favor of President Andrzej Duda, who finally became the president of Poland again for the second term. And uh, speaking about the, 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 key, um, the key narratives uh, which were promoted, uh, uh, I would say that uh, China was uh, mentioned, but less frequently comparing to the Czech Republic, comparing to uh, Hungary. And uh, the only fact about China was that uh, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, Chaputovic, emphasized that China provided uh, some assistance to Poland, but it was a reciprocity measure because when the crisis emerged in China, Poland was also the country which provided humanitarian support to China. So in Poland, it was more or less balanced from the perspective of, um, uh, of uh, uh, fake narratives of disinformation and misinformation, but definitely the virus was uh, instrumentalized uh, by the ruling political party. Then if we move to Ukraine, uh, the situation is different again. Uh, and that, that only proves that we, we do not have uh, some, uh, some uh, patterns which are applicable for the, reason, for the region as a whole. If we move to Ukraine, then we definitely can see that first, uh, both opposition and the ruling political party uh, were more or less cohesive on approaching COVID-19. Well, of course, first, there were some politi politicians who tried to underestimate the role of, of the virus and the role of the problem and the, the, the scope of the problem. However, after some cases and in the parliament of Ukraine, when the members of the parliament got ill, then there was a total cohesion, like all, politi all the political parties were, were promoting the idea that it is important issue and it has to be tackled properly. Uh, but here in Ukraine, we have a different, uh, a different uh, line of conflict. It's the conflict between the central authorities and the local authorities. Uh, to some extent, it can be uh, explained by the proximity of the uh, local elections which have to take place uh, this autumn in Ukraine. But uh, the most, uh, uh, the most uh, vocal case was the sort of, uh, sort of uh, riot of uh, the mayor of uh, the Oblast Center, Cherkasy, against the central power in Ukraine. And he said that uh, by his uh, authority, with his uh, authority, he, he is about to lift uh, the economic restriction, the, re the restrictions for the economic agents, because it's too difficult, difficult for them to, to survive in, in a time of quarantine with this, all these restrictions. Uh, and uh, that was absolutely against the governmental line. And uh, by the decision of the president and the minister of interior, it was National Guard who came to Cherkasy just to, to, to limit uh, uh, the, the decision to, to, to reject the decision of, of the mayor. Uh, however, uh, the, the story can, can be continued because now the mayor is uh, also among those who initiated the party of the mayors called Proposal. Uh, and this political po party might also use this narrative of uh, the necessity to lift uh, restriction for the economic agents against the ruling party in, in, in Kiev, which is the servant of the people, Sluhana Rod. Uh, also speaking about uh, Chinese uh, propelled and uh, Russia propelled narratives. In case of Russia, indeed, we had uh, some narratives uh, which were propelled, fueled by Russian Federation. And uh, there were also 
the cases when uh, the uh, Facebook users who were promoting this fake news uh, were uh, shot by the security service of Ukraine. Uh, uh, back in May, about 2000 accounts, Facebook accounts were blocked by the security service of Ukraine. And also we had a very uh, fruitful cooperation with Facebook. Uh, Facebook uh, officer responsible for Ukraine located in Warsaw is uh, Ukrainian, so she has a clear vision of what's going on uh, in, in the country. And also Facebook is closely cooperated with uh, Stop Fake Initiative in Kyiv, and therefore Facebook also shut down the accounts which were spreading uh, uh, fake news, uh, in, in particular those related to coronavirus. Uh, um, what is interesting in Ukraine, um, another observation, is that at the very first stage of the uh, pandemic, uh, it was mostly uh, regional users, local users, uh, and uh, local media, uh, regional media, which was promoting this uh, misinformation and disinformation and fake news. And it was mostly, I would say, hype oriented, writing about virus to go viral. Uh, but uh, Later on, when, when it became clear that uh, the, the crisis uh, has a global impact, then we have uh, Russians uh, engaged uh, with, with promoting their narratives in Ukrainian media. But the channel was still bloggers and uh, regional media. So, so, so how it was working? Uh, first, uh, a blogger or a local media is publishing uh, fake news then it goes viral and then central media mostly pro russian but not only then central media use this news with a reference to social media or uh, local media <coughs> so that's sort of a backdoor to, to to central media for promoting fake, fake news and uh, for promoting um, disinformation uh, speaking about uh, Russian narratives, it's uh, mostly appealing to society's anxiety and it's mostly uh, blaming the state for being ineffective and inefficient. It's also anti-American trend and uh, the story of biolabs, uh, American biolabs in the territory of Ukraine, Ukraine which might have uh, participated in artificial production of uh, coronavirus uh, was uh, on central media, one plus one channel, one of the most popular one. And we had the official re re reaction of the uh, American State Department and the embassy of the United States to Ukraine, who rejected and uh, who debunked this fake news. Uh, speaking about Chinese related narratives, uh, uh, I wouldn't say that Chinese uh, influence is that uh, clear and, obvi and obvious in Ukraine. Uh, China became very topical uh, in the case of uh, Novi Sanjari. Novi Sanjari is just a small village in, in Poltava Oblast, but it became uh, worldwide known because uh, when uh, the Ukrainian tourists, tourists were evacuated from China, they were brought to Novi Sanjari for, for uh, isolation period. And people in Nova, so Novi Sanjari absolutely were against it. And uh, Ukraine again had to engage National Guard to ensure that people come to, to the place of isolation. And uh, I, I wouldn't say that it brought too much image uh, profit for China. It was rather, it, it was rather uh, anti-China case because of course it was against the, the authorities but again people who were coming from China were, were labeled as uh, people who bring COVID-19 per se and that, that, that didn't didn't, uh, didn't uh, influence uh, Chinese image positively and uh, also speaking about a virus it's often called a Chinese virus and again that doesn't bring too much to, to, to Chinese image, but I have a feeling that Chinese uh, wolf warrior diplomacy is rather applied towards Western Europe and towards Central Europe, but it was not that clear in Ukraine. The Chinese influence was not that clear in Ukraine. But what, what uh, 
what are the common denominators? Uh, it's the, the same, uh, the same narratives about 5G Soros uh, and uh, anti-EU and anti-American. Uh, then uh, with the uh, Russian and Chinese influence, uh, both Russia and China have tailored approach. Uh, I mean, <clears throat> Russia doesn't try to promote uh, its image in Poland because it makes no sense, just a waste of money because of the Polish attitudes towards China, towards Russia. Um, same with, uh, uh, same with uh, Ukraine and China. China doesn't uh, invest too much because uh, anyway, it, it doesn't prove the image or doesn't uh, make the image worse because China is still sort of terra incognita for the region and, and China prefers to spend money in the areas where it has already some achievements like in Central Europe and in Western Europe. And uh, summarizing, uh, I would say that yes, indeed, we have uh, different narratives. Uh, we have common narratives, but uh, we have different ways of instrumentalizing them. In some countries, it's uh, the government which instrumentalizes them against the opposition. In some countries, it's opposition that tries to instrumentalize them against the government. And uh, in Ukraine, we also have this case of uh, central authorities, uh, local authorities rivalry. I will be happy to answer questions, if any, and I guess I will stop here. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sergey. Just one short question for now. One plus one, is that the channel related to Medvedev? Uh, one plus one uh, channel is the channel which uh, is uh, mostly owned by uh, Mr. Kolomoisky, who has uh, the control share, but uh, there are also uh, some percent which belong not to Mr. Medvedev formally, but to his wife. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for the compressed presentation and now I would like to welcome Tornike Zuravashvili, Tornike Zuravashvili from Tbilisi. Yeah, please. The, the second try was correct. Yes, Zuravashvili. Um, thank you. Thank you for recognizing me. Um, I see some familiar faces. Hi to the ones that I know and hi to the ones who I do not know. Thank you for your presentations. I could resonate uh, with many of the points that you have raised, particularly from Latvia and Moldova. Um, I think this is um, really again. Thank you. Thank you to the center, also to the Center for Policy Studies for initiating this discussion. I think this is really high time for discussing discussing it because the uh, pandemic outbreak is not over yet in many of the countries, um, and there are some for the countries who have coped quite well. There are prognoses that it might, it might come back again. So it's important to know um, some of the takeaways that we have previously in, in order to be able to tailor the solutions in the future. Um, for Georgia, the issue is uh, double more important because we are approaching uh, milestone elections. In October, we will have parliamentary elections. And this is a, a, an important issue, particularly because the country has transitioned into uh, from being a presidential repu republic to being a parliamentary republic. So um, it's, a, it's an important, uh, an important event, political event. So it's important that, that we, we reach uh, the elections in an environment that is free of manipulation and disinformation. Um, the Georgian case is also significant because there have been there has been um, some involvement of Facebook in the countermeasures, and I'll be speaking about that uh, a little later. But a little bit on how Georgia has coped uh, with the coronavirus situation. Uh, just a brief outline: the the first case was reported in late February. The country was put under effective state of emergency from March, uh, late March until late May. And the, the government adopted restrictive restrict measures really like quickly after the first case was reported, which had, which had its uh, positive impact, not necessarily on the economy, but in terms of the health parts of it, uh, the responses have, have really deliver, delivered the results. And as of today, the total cases of infection of the coronavirus stand just below 1,200, which is a really good result. Um, the relatively low result of Georgia, Georgian infections of the coronavirus has meant that the, um, the effectiveness of the information operations that have been waged during the coronavirus pandemic, particularly in the lockdown and in, in the state of emergency, during the state of emergency in the months of March, April, and May, haven't been that, that successful. Um, they have remained on the, on the fringes, uh, mostly concentrated in social media, haven't made it, paved their way to the mainstream 
media, but still um, they resonated with certain segments of the population and it's important that we look at it. And it's, it also poses an interesting question because we look at um, most, again, speaking on, on, the, on the actors, I will confine myself to speaking about, uh, about uh, mostly pro-Kremlin, uh, the, the information operations led by the pro-Kremlin actors. Obviously there have been domestic actors as well, um, but those domestic actors have um, acted in, in synchronized in a synchronized way with uh, the pro-Kremlin actors. And if in our own research, our own monitoring of the social media, which we have been doing, uh, also during the the uh, the, uh, the pandemic during during the during the state of uh, state of emergency, pointed the fact that most um, disinformation and fake news and uh, manipulations have been spread by actors that are either directly funded by the Kremlin or are affiliated with uh, the Kremlin actors, so the actors of the of Georgian reg registration, but those that also write in Georgian, but those who have uh, close association with pro-Kremlin actors. Um, a little bit on the general features of it, uh, unlike the Ukrainian uh, case, um, this was much less decentralized, much, uh, much, much less decentralized. So we would see a lot of coordination in terms of the messaging, in terms of the timing, um, and in terms of the means of, 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 of uh, spreading the information, which points at the extent of coordination and which points at the fact that this is, this is, these are certain people of certain actors, certain specific actors who come up with the, with the, with the points. Obviously those are not innovative points. And uh, if, you, if, 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 we, if you think of it, uh, um, you know, many, many of, of the points that have been raised in Georgia are also um, salient for Latvia, for Romania, for Moldova. So one would think whether it's one brain thinking about it. Um, but yeah, you know, much less de decentralized, but very much tailored to specific audience. So they, they, they pick specific, specific audiences, then they feed those messages to them. It's also mutually exclusive. Uh, the fact that it's tailored, um, it sort of uh, puts uh, those messages in, in conflict with each other. Um, some of the messages that have been raised um, Again, they resonate with uh, many of the things that have been said previously. One, for instance, that is slightly different is that uh, the uh, news front um, media, a media outlet that uh, entered the Georgian market in November, started a Georgian outlet, then um, assembled uh, a, a network of uh, fake media, fake, fake social media accounts, um, whether it's uh, you know pages, groups, uh, or individual accounts. They started uh, peddling sev several points, several messages, and this is from our monitoring again. One is that um, developed European nations, while developed European nations are un unable to cope with the with the virus, Georgia, a developing nation, a country who should not be supposed um, to be doing well, is doing better than the European countries. So it's a, it's a, it's a double propaganda. So at, at the same time, you're highlighting the fact that Georgia shouldn't be able to cope with the, the virus well. And at the same time, you're saying that European countries are not, are not dealing with the, the outbreak um, um, successfully. The second issue that they have been pointing at, so this is, this, if, you, if you categorize this um, under a, a general theme, we could say this is anti-Western. And there have been other anti-Western um, messages, um, messages spread. Uh, for instance, uh, that um, Italy is supported by, by the Chinese government and not by friends in Brussels and, and Washington, D.C. Same applied for Georgia. There were, oh, this is an obvious fake, um, but same applied for Georgia, saying that the Chinese government is sending medical kits, whereas the United States and the European Union are not doing, doing anything, uh, which is an outright lie, obviously. Um, another thing that they have been trying to peddle is that um, the virus was created and purpose purposefully leaked by the U.S. Army. I will touch upon a little later on that because this is not uh, on, this is not a lower level like media level um, intervention. This was also um, propelled by by official lines by the Minister for Foreign Affairs of the Russian Federation. A little bit on that, I will I will I will brief on that uh, a little later. The other points that ha they have raised. Um, um, resonated with the religious um, um, conservatives uh, because the lockdown measures meant that uh, the churches were also um, unable to continue the masses. Obviously, most of the churches dismissed those restrictions, and there was a lot of public discussions discussion about that. And then 
the news front and affiliated uh, Georgian media outlets and actors um, arguing that uh, the government uh, was against uh, against uh, the Orthodox Church by um, ruling that the, the, ch the churches should be closed. Um, the uh, other points that they have raised and they have um, and some of them went into into complete conspiracies is that this was uh, you know rich families running the world wanting to, wanting to control the populations then the 5 5g technology and then you know bill gates wanting to micro microchip humans and one more line that they have taken was um uh, discrediting campaigns against uh, the country's two top epidemiologists who were running the uh, the coronavirus response, the health aspects of it, and I promised I would I would speak about the uh, about the bio warfare allegations that was you know purposefully uh, leaked by the U.S. Army. Um, this is not a new allegation um, raised by by official lines in Moscow and also unofficial um, lines um, you know in 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 Georgia who are of um, of uh, pro Kremlin mind. Um, is uh, allegations against the uh, the so-called Luger Lab. It's a biological research facility that is based outside of Tbilisi. It was opened with uh, U.S. government support, but is uh, managed, owned, and uh, funded by the Georgian Health Ministry. The lab itself um, allowed the Georgian government to have uh, full geography of the spread of the virus. So it, it's a it's a cutting edge technology. I mean, it's a research ordinary research facility facility um, that. Um, uh, that that uh, that helped Georgia a lot with the coronavirus response, but at the same time received a lot of criticism from Moscow and from affiliated entities. Um, on May 26, uh, perhaps intentionally timed on Georgia's Independence Day, the Ministry of, uh, of Foreign Affairs of, of the Russian Federation issued a statement and accusing the lab, not directly, but sort of hinting of double activities, and then. Um, of failing to or accusing the, the the lab of failing to explain its its purposes uh, on the border with the with the Russian Federation. Then it sort of um, tried it it, it started um, you know hierarchically coming down uh, fr from top to bo bottom and made made its made its way to 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 first official Russian media then uh, to its uh, Georgian. Um, language outlets, uh, Sputnik and News Front, and then to, uh, to, to other mediums of, of information that are affiliated with those entities. Um, an interesting case was that, uh, and as I said, this, is, this, is, um, this has been, those allegations have been there for quite some time. The Luger Lab has been accused of experiment, of even experimenting with human health, um, then of, of you know, spreading deadly viruses, the bird flu, flu and everything. Um, an interesting case is that uh, the um, de facto authorities in Sinhalia and Abkhazia have parroted those, have oftentimes do parrot those uh, allegations. This time around, uh, they accused uh, the, um, the Luger Lab, the, not the Luger Lab, but the National Center for Disease Control, which owns the Luger Lab. Luger Lab is a subsidiary of that, of that entity. It accused the National Center for Disease Control of, co for, of, of commissioning um, certain fees uh, for people living um, on the, close to the occupation line to make their way to, to the occupied territory and, and bring bats from there so that they could, bat, bat samples, a bat colony, so that they could, they could investigate the bats from South Ossetia. So, you know, allegations as crazy as that, but they are still there and they get leaked into, uh, and they go bottom down to, um, to, to a specific users. Uh, to, 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 so to sum up, uh, Georgia is approaching uh, parliamentary elections um, in October, we, as uh, as as a as a monitoring and watchdog organization, will be will be looking at the social media um, quite um, um, extensively. Will be um, and we will be working with Facebook. Just as uh, Sergi said, we have had uh, quite a um, good cooperation with with uh, with Facebook representatives um, who have uh, um, who have also intervened with uh, a takedown in April. Uh, 2020, and the previous takedown was in December. In, in, in April, they took down a Newsfront affiliated, not the Newsfront uh, page itself, but Newsfront affiliated uh, local actors on Facebook. Um, I've been speaking about Facebook. I should have given you a little heads up. Uh, I've, be, I've been speaking about Facebook mostly, but Facebook is where most, where Georgians spend their most time. And with, uh, you know, under the lockdown, 
they were obviously spending more time there. Uh, so this is the most popular and most populous uh, populous uh, platform for discuss for political discussion. So they are, no wonder why they are targeting that. I'll stop at that. If there are any other questions, uh, please do not hesitate uh, to ask. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tomika. So just about front news. It I think it's connected to the Eurasian Institute, if I'm not mistaken. What is what was the question again? Sorry, uh, the front news Georgia is connected to the Eurasian Institute individually. Is yes, it? I mean, I don't think they have institutional cooperation, they're usually very um helpful about um, announcing their connections. Uh, but individually, yes, in terms of the people who, who were behind them, it, it's it's one one crowd, well, one crowd of one segment of, of the people, and they just exchange with, with roles. But institutionally, they wouldn't say that they are connected with each other. Um, so yeah, yeah, but, uh, your institutions and also media development funds, the foundations work with Facebook was very impressive, I think. Um, yes, I, I, you... um, what we do um, at ISFED, I mean, we are a democracy and elections watchdog, so our primary um, operations are election monitoring, but since the 2018, we have ventured into social media monitoring. We have developed a methodological approaches of monitoring political activity and electoral activity um, on, on Facebook. And since then, we have been, have been following uh, the political development quite closely, so coronavirus was sort of a continuation of some of our, our um, prior efforts to um, have an idea, have a grasp of, of, of what, what is happening on, on social media. Because again, as I said, a lot of political activity takes place. Many of the political parties are, are you know, getting rid of our other channels of, 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 of uh, information transition, transition and then are moving into Facebook so that they can reach out to more people. So there is a lot of activity and this activity needs to be accounted for. And plus the problem uh, that we have been raising with uh, Facebook and we have had some success because um, they promised, so our, our sort of request was that, um, as, as, as we said, that there, uh, there is a lot of political activity there, a lot of sponsoring um, of uh, political parties on Facebook. Uh, which is which doesn't go in the, into the state audit office, which deals with political finances. So in the previous election, for instance, no one disclosed of uh, disclosed their uh, spending on on Facebook, and we want to have a, have an idea what what is happening there. We reached out to Facebook, and they were uh, they were kind to respond to us, um, and um, um, and uh, they promised that in from beginning from August they will have stri stricter requirements for for placing political ads and those political ads will be disclosed uh, for the public scrutiny. Um, and uh, Sergei has mentioned, uh, uh, Sergei has men mentioned an Ukrainian national who is a point of contact for us um, as well. So um, we're happy, we're happy that this cooperation continues and uh, um, we're happy that there is this joint effort uh, by, by civil society organization. And you rightly mentioned Armin that uh, the Media Development Foundation the DFR lab and the Georgia's Reforms Associates, Associates and many more uh, organizations have been doing a lot of work to um, understand the phenomena of, uh, of disinformation and then debunk and then try to advocate for more structural interventions. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So uh, let me now make also a brief presentation. But first I will briefly continue the biological laboratories issue. Because if I remember, the Lugas Center near Tbilisi was opened in 2018, or 2011, sorry. But even before yeah. that, when uh, there was an African swine fever outbreak in Russia in 2007-8, there were also allegations that it originated from the Georgian territory as a part of a US-backed conspiracy. There were some publications yes, that about was, that, that, that as well. That was when they announced announced uh, the opening of it. So it was inaugurated in the the more the better word would be would be it was inaugurated in 2011. The building of um, of the actual lab, the idea of building it, uh, I think it, it 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 arrived in 2005 or 2006. So then then they started building it, and it was it was completed in 2011. But you're you're right to correct that those allegations have been there for uh, quite some time before that as well. 
Yeah, so uh, there are also some US sponsored laboratories in Armenia opened since 2016 and also similarly vilified since the moment when they opened. Uh, several non authentic civil society organizations whose views have been promoted by local media as well as Regnum, EA Daily, and other Russian websites allege that the laboratories could be performing also bioweapon related experiments. So, like in the Georgian case, the issue became a recurrent propaganda topic. And in March this year, the allegations, such allegations, became an integral part of a coronavirus related disinformation. There was a sequence of interviews in A Daily claiming that the COVID-19 could not appear as, as a result of a spontaneous genetic recombination, so it was a biological warfare agent from the US. So that the activities of the laboratories in Armenia were targeting Russia and Iran and so forth. Moscow's Komsomol also hinted that there was a bioweapon research like saying that like the Guantanamo jail, these laboratories are outside the US territory, so they can be involved in activities which are legal in the US. Then uh, for a few weeks, starting in April, there was an actively advertised Facebook page in Armenia titled No to Virus Produ Producing American Laboratories, again promoting the same narratives. And uh, uh, there was also a number of other, so to say, imported narrative conspiracy theories promoted in the media and social networks about the 5G telecommunication technology, about Bill Gates, certain actions like that he sponsored a defective polio vaccine in India and over 400,000 children got paralyzed. That already a more local story that Bill Gates planned for 60,000 people in Armenia to die from the COVID-19, but this is a part of a global story about plans to reduce the population. And uh, there is a more important local story that Armenian health authorities bribed the relatives of deceased persons so they would accept falsified statements about the causes of death. This may be put aside not just because it's not an imported one, but because it became the first story related to COVID-19 promoted actively by one of the structures that I would call inauthentic NGOs. So several such NGOs appeared in the recent months. One of their characteristic features is having somebody with a medical degree as a frontman who promotes this story or anti-vaccination narratives or advocates against using masks in public space and so on. In one recent example, early this week, a pharmacist claimed that wearing masks causes respiratory problems related to the reduced flow of oxygen, as well as fungi-related diseases. And Open Democracy a few weeks ago exposed one of such entities which has been calling, calling COVID-19 a fake pandemic and has been opposing vaccinations, managing to get over 131,000 views for an anti-vaccination article on this website, which is a really huge number for Armenia. And such narratives are also amplified by a huge network of media and social media accounts related to some former officials and some current opposition figures and related groups which became active in the last years. Referring to some of such groups, the Freedom House Nations in Transit report published this spring mentioned Armenia among the countries where, quote, far-right violent extremist groups have also been making their voices heard. They have demonstrated a new level of cross-border cooperation, unquote. So, although in Armenia, disinformation campaigns are mostly funded from within, of course, there is Sputnik Armenia and some other outlets, but still most of spending is done domestically. 
the narratives usually follow already internationally familiar lines, like in the case of vaccination related allegations, similar to those used in Italy, which I mentioned at the beginning. And there are maybe some numerous other examples, and not only concerning the pandemic related issues as such. Uh, for example, Andrea Yelisev's study, Sputnik Belarus Propaganda and Disinformation, published in April by the International Strategic Action Network for Security, showed that Sputnik routinely depicted Ukraine as a failed foreign control state, that the Baltic states were presented as larger Western countries, serfs or puppets. The US, the so called Anglo Saxons, and the West as a whole were also commonly vilified. And very similar coverage of Ukraine, the Baltic states, the US and the Anglo-Saxons was observed by some Armenian studies, for example, in a monitoring by the experts of the Iran based analytical center on globalization and regional cooperation, who monitored several Russian and Armenian media. And moreover, concerning the failed foreign control state narrative, the media and social media accounts related to some former officials and the current opposition, which I mentioned shortly before, have been spinning the same narrative about Armenia, claiming that the planned appointment of EU high level advisors for implementation of some sectoral reforms as part of the EU Armenia comprehensive and enhanced partnership agreement, and also the planned appointment of an anti corruption advisor by the EU Department of State, make Armenia a foreign control state. And, but in fact, the more radical proxy groups have been claiming that Armenia is a foreign control state for over two years now, ascribing control to George Soros. But, so I have covered some of the mentioned issues in previous publications and shall, shall cover more in future publications and events. So now I would give the floor for some questions and comments. And first, perhaps, if some of the presenters would like to comment or ask questions to the others, we may do such around. Armin, if I may. Yes, please. Yes, please. Um, uh, when we try to study the channels, uh, we had a discussion, and uh, I, I want to ask uh, to what extent uh, the usage of Telegram uh, application is uh, relevant because in Ukraine it's getting uh, more and more influential and uh, nowadays we are even discussing whether it is still a messenger or already a social media. To what extent the usage of Telegram applications is uh, relevant in your countries and how influential Telegram is in your countries? Not so much influential in Armenia but uh, getting Influence, some influence more gradually or slowly. I would say that in Latvia, the most uh, common place for misinformation, disinformation, conspiracy theories is still Facebook and um, to a certain degree Twitter, but definitely not Telegram. Although, uh, one more thing that I must admit, uh, and we didn't talk about it at all today, it's WhatsApp. Uh, usually those connections between um, your, your friends, uh, there's an easy way to spread the, the disinformation. Respectively, I saw a mis misinformation post uh, on Facebook, and then I decided to forward it to someone in my WhatsApp group. And via WhatsApp, a lot of misinformation, disinformation is spreading, and Latvia is not an exclusion in that. I have a question, if it's possible. Hello, everyone. Uh, very interesting discussion. I uh, must say uh, that is really important. Uh, my question is, um, if uh, the Twitter is part of uh, this disinformation campaign, I'm here in the US, and uh, Twitter is a big part of political discourse in US, also because of US president, but uh, also is uh, part of the disinformation campaign. I'm curious to know in different uh, European countries if Twitter is uh, 
start and if it is how big is uh, twitter uh, disinformation campaign in different countries thank you uh, i'd like to jump in if i may and i will partly answer um sergey's uh, question as well um as arthur yeah, said sure. uh, in georgia too uh, facebook uh, is, is is the is the biggest um, uh, venue platform for political discussions. I wouldn't say the same for tweet, Twitter. Um, uh, it, uh, the Georgians, for some reason, maybe maybe for the linguistic reasons, because it's harder for in, in the Georgian to express. Um, when I'm, I'm hearing the echo. I think. Yeah, I express uh, words in in a precise manner. Um, and that is why the Georgians have not pick, picked it up. Uh, what we have observed recently, however, is that. Uh, the, TikTok, the Chinese uh, platform, has been uh, p picking quite a, 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 a number, quite 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 a huge numbers, and it is it is popular with uh, the younger generation, um, mostly. Um, but also the political actors are 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 sort of trying to follow the trend and open it uh, up, and we'll see how it goes. We also see some activity on Instagram, but. It's not something massive that would uh, have a lot of impact. So Facebook, I would say we will remain the, the biggest one in coming future. And it might be challenged, challenged by TikTok, but we don't know yet. Uh, the, uh, the, the, share are quite, the shares of it are quite dis, 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 disproportionate, disproportionate at this point. Thank you. I want to say an answer from the Latvia about the Twitter. So um, if you analyze the Twitter and uh, the Facebook, uh, usually the maps, which is uh, what we have also the parliament members, um, they're using the, the Twitter platform to post their opinions. So that's why this is the similar as uh, in the US. Um, and in that case, and I also was uh, going to mention before, but uh, the colleague mentioned it uh, about the uh, TikTok and also the Snapchat, which is completely more popular than the Instagram. And we talk if we talk and see that these tendencies, which is going uh, going now about this information, misinformation, then the uh, this Twitter, Facebook, and uh, Snapchat, I guess it's the most popular trends in Latvia. And maybe my colleague Arthur is going to add something. I would only I would only say that uh, with regards to Twitter, uh, what Alexandra mentioned is that um, uh, usually the opinion of some politicians may be an honest delusion, um, if, especially if we talk about uh, our politicians here, local politicians. Although there is some an exce some exception to that, and this is what I mentioned in our presentation before that. There are some opposition politicians, and they, on the other hand, uh, may use uh, some vicious tactics in order to attack the government and uh, government politicians. But again, uh, we can't say anything that much with, when it comes to Twitter. Mostly, it's still Facebook. If you want an insight from Ukraine, I just opened the statistics and, uh, well, the, the, the level of spread of disinformation via social media depends on the popularity of social media. And in our case, it's Facebook 58% of uh, popularity, YouTube 41% and Instagram 28, which means that it's mostly Facebook, but also YouTube, which is also used for, for spreading disinformation. But but uh, but Twitter is not that popular, therefore it's it's not used. Uh, the case of Romania it's similar to Ukraine, mostly on Facebook. Uh, it's uh, usually uh, used for mostly Facebook is used to to spread this information. Twitter is not popular at all in Romania, and Instagram is popular also. But um, the Romanians are using Instagram only for for short messages and usually they are not related to disinformation, just social life and health and such stuff. And uh, for Moldova, Miss Alaroshka, you know that uh, Adna Klasnik is still on the table. So uh, it's used by, by the, by the go uh, government, it's used by the, by the public authorities. So Adna Klasnik and Facebook, it's still, 
it's still there and it's used to, to spread the, this information and messages to influence the, the behavior of the, of the potential voters for, for politicians. Yes, by yes. politicians. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, in Armenia, also, Twitter is not so popular. Maybe the same issue like in Georgia. It, uh, the message should be too short for most of people to formulate uh, what, they, what they want to say. And, and not many people are also interested in following it. It's mostly English speaking people who want to follow the economist or some Western publications. So it's another kind of people who use Twitter in Armenia, but Adna Klasnik and to some extent Kontakti also play the role, especially among people who have relatives working in Russia, living there. So, and TikTok, uh, among the youth of certain kind, uh, the TikTok is getting more popularity than Telegram or other relatively new messengers. As a trend for Facebook, I know that for disinformation also are used uh, Facebook groups, uh, the Facebook group that are closed. I had the chance to communicate with one expert from, from Hamilton 68 and I asked him why you approach only Twitter accounts for to study the spread of disinformation. They, and they have mentioned this, this problem for them that they don't have access to, to Facebook groups in order to, to, com to combine the data that they are um, uh, getting from uh, Twitter and from other social media. So Facebook groups are used um, to spread this information. So any other questions? Uh, okay, then uh, maybe you may summarize if you wish in the same order, perhaps, mm -hmm. uh, as the presentation at the beginning. Can I ask, uh, ask a question to, um, to oh, our um, Latvian? Romanian and Moldovan colleagues. Um, we've heard from Sergei and I have also briefed on uh, on the involvement of Facebook, the, the company in um, the, the takedowns of uh, certain pages. And has that been the case uh, in your countries as well? And if not, um, ha have there been any attempts to reach out to uh, the company? Um, so we have two quite large medias that are working with Facebook as a fact checkers. And they are doing, I would say quite well, uh, although still it's not enough, knowing that a lot of people are spreading the disinformation. Not only that, uh, this is done by casual users. So we're not talking about some malicious uh, pages that are putting this information as, a, as an, as an uh, is a factory, yeah, uh, post by post, uh, minute by minute. So that's why um, it's really hard to pin them down. And one more important thing here is obviously known as delusion. When someone is thinking that they're spreading the right information in order to help others, uh, unfortunately, in most of the cases, it's not helping at all. It makes it even worse. So I would say that to summarize, uh, to, to, to answer your question, Tonika, is that um, indeed we have uh, two quite large, again, said, uh, media that are working with uh, Facebook via, via fact checking. And, and of course, some pages were, were closed down, but I wouldn't say that they were, they were very big. And one more important thing here is uh, that I got to mention is that a lot of uh, our oppositional politicians are thinking that these. Uh, outlets are working uh, uh, with censorship, basically uh, not allowing them to, to, to speak the truth, yes, uh, so to speak. And uh, this is yet another thing that we must, uh, I guess, discuss at some point that these fact checkers are perceived as those that are censoring, which is, as we know, not true at all. They're just fact checking. And, 
uh, there is no such a thing as Paul, there is no such a thing as a, I have a one fact, you have another fact, and doesn't work. I mean, the, the Earth is not is not flat, for instance, uh, and we can we can't go with that. So um, here is one thing that I think we, we we may discuss in the future. Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, in uh, I just may mention that in our mini case, we haven't managed to establish effective communication with Facebook in this sense. Uh, regarding Moldova, you know the, the well-known case of the parliamentary elections last year in February. We had the shutdown of many Facebook uh, accounts that uh, were um, administrated from the government building. These were the accounts uh, uh, created by the people from uh, Democratic uh, Party. And, uh, and indeed, uh, a few experts reached the, the Facebook company in order to, to shut down those uh, Facebook accounts. Uh, this year, I cannot tell you anything new about uh, some similar cases, but uh, it's great that we have the project right now as we have local elections in Romania in autumn and also presidential elections in Moldova. And you have in Georgia also parliamentary election, if I'm, I'm right. And we, we will see how uh, the political actors will use the Facebook accounts, will use the social media in order to spread not only political messages, but also false information or disinformation. Uh, and uh, we'll try to, to reach as many voters as possible in this uh, period. And also as a conclusion, uh, I hope that we will manage to um, select some, some subjects that are most important for our country that we are representing and we will have this opportunity, this great opportunity to, to do this comparative analysis and to see how we can uh, adapt and how we can work together in cooperation in order to support those actors that uh, are doing the, the, the hard work in order to, to fight against disinformation. I mean, uh, also the, the public institutions in this case, because there are many uh, good intentions regarding disinformation. If I may intervene for, for a second, uh, Arthur, you raised a very important issue of censorship, but uh, uh, in Ukraine, we have a different case. It's, it's not about censorship per se. It's a, it's a story of defamation of uh, the organizations which are fact checkers. It's a famous case of stop fake which is a true success story, but now it's being blamed for censoring, uh, for, for, for misconduct and misuse of their cooperation with Facebook uh, and bias towards leftist organizations. Be, and that's labeling stop, stop fake as ultra rightist organization or even neo-Nazi organization just to, 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 to show them as biased uh, to kill their reputation. And uh, therefore, to to to, to uh, terminate them as 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 a player on on a field. So it's indeed very important not only to 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 talk about censorship issue, but also to talk about the necessity to protect the reputation of fact checkers. Otherwise, they will be just uh, blamed for all sins in the world and uh, will use lose their reputation. Thank you. So uh, let's just summarize in a few minutes. So, shall we shall we go uh, one by one or how? Uh, yes, please. Okay, since, since it was me, I will continue here. Um, I think the uh, the Georgian case really um, highlights uh, two facts. One is that there has been um, centralized actions, interventions by uh, Kremlin-funded and pro-Kremlin 
local author uh, on local outlets uh, and they have uh, used um, se several types of messages which also resonate with the with other countries and they have done that uh, quite uh, intensively the fact that it hasn't had uh, so much uh, impact was because the numbers of in infections haven't been high so so the, the people have been so really nervous with with obviously there was a, a, a lot of anger uh, in the uh, a lot of uh, expectations in in uh, negative expectations in Georgian society but it hasn't resonated with, with resonated with wider segments of the population and part of this has also to do with uh, how the civil society organizations have acted uh, I think uh, one important thing that have, they have done is uh, they have monitored it on a regular basis. And the second is that they have uh, tried to offer more structural solutions, um, you know, by, by forging partnership with Facebook and by then um, securing uh, the takedown of, of some of the Sputnik news front affiliated media. I think this has to continue and this is something that other countries could also replicate um, as well. Um, so this is basically it. Thank you. Next, please. Um, yes, I, I, I may continue. Um, the one important thing like that I guess uh, we can say after this roundtable discussion, which was absolutely great, and very interesting, uh, found out something that I never thought that I will hear from uh, representative from Romania and Moldova, that church, in particular Orthodox Church, plays a quite significant role in that. I've heard it about Russia, uh, which I find kind of an obvious thing, but from Romania and Moldova, that's quite an interesting thing. That's a quite an interesting insight. And uh, from that on, I can say that Despite the fact that um, there are some unique situation in all of the countries that uh, were discussed today, some common things arise. Uh, first and foremost, one of the most popular social platforms to, to spread uh, the disinformation is Facebook. And it's, it's, I guess we have to do something with that in the first place. Second of all, uh, major states, in particular Russia and China, plays quite a significant role in spreading the disinformation. Thirdly, uh, one of the most, still the most important prevailing themes are to a certain degree social rather than economic. Uh, we're talking about uh, the way how people are going to get, to, um, going to get vaccinated or uh, where the virus has come from and we, and if we know when it comes from, we can understand what the government or other those uh, uh, vicious wild people such as George Soros and Bill Gates are going to do with us. So people, it seems to me, public and society is mostly concerned with the way uh, what is going on with our social future, with our lives rather than economic issues. Although still I must admit that one of the most uh, important interesting narratives uh, that is spread um, is obviously that uh, Eastern partnership states and Baltic states and Central Europe, Europe, Europe states are going to get uh, very hard when it comes to overcoming the economic issues of the coronavirus. So uh, this is how I would sum this up. Thank you. Uh, Actually, that is why I have mentioned the church and uh, I have mentioned the importance to look at the actors that are spreading the disinformation as uh, we have a status quo for church in, under many governments. And this is a very important player during the election, electoral campaigns. Uh, church is uh, mm, uh, fueling the official campaigns of disinformation, and they are in, very close to the, to the government. They also, uh, in, in the case of Moldova, they address to the government in order to stop the forced vaccination of the population and uh, chipping and expansion of the 5, 5G. Uh, and in, 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 the, in this case, uh, mm, 
church has the role to disinform people, but also to promote political messages. And uh, instead to, to fight and get, to convince people to, to respect the rules, to respect the procedures that are uh, taken by the, by the authorities, they are actually asking to, to avoid sanctions against them. And the president uh, has expressed the, uh, the opinion that he will take into consideration to, to cancel the sanctions against the representative of the, of the church in Moldova. And uh, uh, the church in Moldova is involved in, uh, in the spreading of disinformation because uh, it uh, um, has these connections to, to Moscow church. Uh, so they are in, a, in subordination uh, somehow and, uh, and they are fighting uh, for the same uh, values. In this case are the traditional values of Russian uh, uh, government that they are trying to, to promote in the, in the region. And uh, why in Romania? Because we are, we are Orthodox Church and uh, somehow we, we, we have the same values and, and, in, and principles. So it's not important only the subordination to, to Moscow, but in this case, it's also important the, the values that we are cherishing the same values, Orthodox values, and not those uh, Western values that are so decadent in, in the last uh, years. So this explains a lot of, uh, uh, of uh, the messages that are uh, promoted by by church in the in the in the society and the support that uh, the church gets from from people. We have also some uh, civil society organization that are supporting the church in this uh, uh, disinformation campaign, but we have also a lot of watchdog organization that are very aware about the impact. So at the same time, we should promote as experts that critical thinking approach to disinformation among, among not only us experts, but also uh, to reach those regions where the, uh, the messages should be, uh, should be explained to, to the people. Not only to talk on Zoom, as Sergei mentioned uh, at the beginning of his presentation, I hope that sooner or later we will have this opportunity to, to meet with each other and in order to, to avoid the uh, uh, this uh, online meeting only among a few experts. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Angela. And so, Sergey, would you like to? Just, just, you also... just summarizing um, the discussion. In, in, indeed, we uh, managed to find out that uh, there are many similarities. Uh, I mean, the roots of uh, misinformation and disinformation in both cases, in, in most cases, are the same. The channels of disinformation and misinformation in most cases are the same. But uh, the level of our resilience differs. And uh, that's why it is really important to combine the efforts of those who are in front uh, to support those who are, who are behind. And to, that, that, that's why such international endeavors are very important because we can learn from each other and we can apply. We do not have to invent the bicycle if it was already invented by someone, but we can, we can, we can learn a lot from each other. So, so many thanks for this endeavor and for this opportunity to listen and to learn. Uh, thank you very much. So. Let me just conclude this time. It's already almost half past eight here. So thank you very much for your contributions. Very insightful and I got a lot of information and also new ideas from today's discussion. And I would also like to thank those who have taken part in the discussion or have been following online. Uh, we shall have publications covering the present issues in more detail, as well as other discussions, including a few more discussions in this format beginning in September. So please follow us on the partners pages and publications and feel free to send, send feedback and join the future events. 
and have a nice evening and a nice weekend. Thank you, Armin, for hosting the event. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Armin. Thank you. I'll see you soon. Bye. Bye.